confession is we just heard the scripture, we just sung those songs. How much confidence do you have in your God today? How much confidence do you have in him? Right? Because that's what it's all about. The reality is, as we come to this healing this morning in John chapter 5, as I've studied the gospel of Luke, it appears to be every person that comes to Jesus for healing in Luke, he heals. But as we're going to see this morning, he doesn't heal everyone. The reality is, how many of you are dealing with physical ailments in your life at all? How many of you have asked God to heal you and for possibly years and you still don't have your healing. You know, we, we tend to think that God is a good God only when he does what we ask him to. Only when he heals when we ask him to heal. God is good whether he heals or not, church. And when he does, it's just one more part of his goodness and grace to us in our lives. This morning, as we go into John chapter 5, I want to begin by talking about something good happening that leads to something controversial. Do you ever think about that in your life? You ever had something good happen in your life that turned out controversial? So that's one thing I want us to think about this morning. And the other thing I want us to think about as we go to the text is being in a situation where you've had little attention paid to you. You're kind of like a nobody. You're just a blob in the crowd, a, a spot in the crowd. Blob, a spot in the crowd. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and then everybody is, like, paying attention to you. Well, that's what we're going to see this morning in the text. Okay? This is exactly similar what, to what happens to the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. The question I want us to ask, and this is going to be really significant, so... Hang on to this, this question that I'm hitting us with up front. What interaction occurs between Jesus and the lame man? Okay, there's going to be an interaction between Jesus and the lame man. And the lame man and the Jews, because he's going to have an interaction with the Jews, that is actually going to result in the interaction between Jesus and the Jews, which is going to set up the ongoing interaction he's going to have with them in the gospel in, in chapter 5. Okay, so God is going to use the lame man interacting with Jesus to cause an interaction with the Jews, which eventually will bring Jesus and the Jews on a crash course with one another. And I want us to see this morning in this, this uh, healing that it's not accidental. Okay, so let's look at that. First of all, in verses 1 through 9, I want us to see the compassion of Jesus in the question of healing. So if you looked at your uh, insert for this morning, where it says a question of healing, a questioning of healing, no, that's not a repeat. Catch that carefully. A question of healing, which we'll see in verses 1 through 9, and then a questioning of healing, which we'll see in 10 through 16. Okay? So that was, that was not a misprint. That was intentional. Okay? So first of all, 1 through 9, the compassion of Jesus and the question of healing. Let me read the, the text to us. After these things, okay, that would be after the interaction with the Samaritans, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who are sick, blind, lame, and withered, and then you'll see in parentheses, I'll explain that in a minute. Waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain seasons in the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. 
Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. There's two questions that we're going to focus on this morning. The first question is in this section, verses 1 through 9. And then there's a second question, which the Jews ask of the lame man. So this lame man is the, the center of what's, being, what's happening here in this text in John 5. First of all, he'll be asked a question by Jesus. And then after the healing, he will be asked a question by the Jews. The first question, this question of healing, is in verse 6. Uh, verse, um, six do you wish to be, to be well? Now, that's a, a strange question. Do you wish to get well? We'll talk about this in a minute. Why would you ask somebody who's sick if they want to get well? Okay? So that's the question that everything else hinges around in this first set of verses. Jesus asked, I believe, this question of healing because of love. Because of love. And you'll see the contrast to the Jews, the question they ask him is because of the law. And what you're going to see is the heart of Jesus versus the heart of these religious leaders. So let's look at the circumstances surrounding this in verses 1 through 7. I just read it. What we see here is Jesus leaves Samaria. Remember where Samaria is? It's the middle, it's the middle of the country. And he's, he's coming down from Cana of Galilee, Cana and Capernaum, that area. He's coming down, and he's now coming back into Judea in Jerusalem. Right? So he's going to go up. Why did I say up? Even though he's going down south, he's going up because the elevation rises toward Jerusalem. From Galilee, as you go up to Jerusalem, it rises. Okay? Verse 2. There in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. So he's going to come to there because of a feast. Now, it's interesting. There's, I read a bunch of commentaries this week. It said there's a speculation about the, the fact is which feast was it. One of the commentators said, well, it's, it could very well be the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles. I might argue against that because in chapter 7, two chapters later, we see the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Passover. So unless Jesus is in this region from chapter 5 through chapter 7, I'm not sure it's the same feast. Although some say, one of the, one of the earliest manuscripts says that they believe that this tr is translated the Feast of the Jews. And when the Feast of the Jews is translated, um, it can be the Feast of Passover, or the Feast of uh, Tabernacles in the fall. It doesn't matter. All we know is that the feast draws Jesus to Jerusalem. Again, watch God's incredible hand in all of this. So he goes to Jerusalem, okay? In Jerusalem by the sheep gate, there's a sheep gate. On the outside of the sheep gate is a pool, okay? Outside, there is a pool. And um, we didn't get the PowerPoint for this week, I'm guessing, okay? But I had a picture of, of the, sh the, the sheep gate and the, the two pools. There's actually... Two pools next to each other outside of the sheep gate. Okay? All right? And so Jesus, and, the, and it tells us in verse 3, and these lay a multitude of those who are sick, blind, lame, and withered. Now, this is interesting. This context is interesting. Because if you look at what's in parentheses, right after that, everything from the end of 3 to the end of 4 they say wasn't added. It wasn't in the earliest manuscript. It wasn't added till later. And people will argue over that. They'll debate over that. Well, it shouldn't be in Scripture. It's not really Scripture. You know what? I'm not a scholar, and, I, and I'm not going to debate that, whether or not it's meant to be in Scripture or not. I know the NASB translators choose to put it in. Some do not. One of the things I want to say up front is it doesn't change the context completely of what's going on. Except, except if you read down, the sick man says in verse 7, I have nobody to put me in the pool when the water is being stirred up. Now, why in the world would he say that in the original manuscript in verse 7 if 3 and 4 isn't meant to be in the text? Okay, this is interesting. So Jesus comes to this man who, if you read the text in 3 and 4, 
He is laying there among many others, hoping for what? Hoping for a healing, right? And what's interesting about what's in the, in the parentheses is whether or not the Jews believed this themselves, there was a superstition that surrounded this pool because they believed the pool had healing waters. There was a superstition that it had healing waters, and if the angel of the Lord would come in a particular season and stir it, the first person into the pool would get healed. Now just think about that. This place is full of sick, Lyme, Blaine, withered people, right? And they're hoping that maybe they'll be the first one in the pool. So what you sense in this text is a sense of hopelessness, absolute hopelessness for this group of people. He didn't come down, the, 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 the angel of the Lord, according to superstition, didn't come down on a regular basis. He came down at certain seasons. Now, whether or not they knew when that was and they, they were there for that particular time or they just hung on waiting, hoping that something would happen and they would be able to be the first one in the pool to get healed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the hopelessness that goes with that? We don't know how many were laying there. There were probably many. There could have been hundreds. We don't know. Can you imagine of the hundreds, knowing that you might, today might be your day of healing. Today might be the day you get healed because the waters are stirred. And what I think is interesting, in the middle of this, we, t we see in verse 5 that a man was there who'd been ill for 38 years. Now, we don't know how old the man was. All the text tells us is he was there for 38 years. Now, I want you to think back to 38 years in your life. Eric, how old are you? 31. So, negative 7 for Eric. Okay? <laughs> negative 7. Micah, you're 30, so I know it's similar to you. Some of us are older. I'm, I'm 61. And so, if you go back 38 years, that's 23. That was the age I got saved. I don't know how old this guy was. All I know is he's been in this lame condition for 38 years, unable to walk. Now, if you've ever seen somebody in a wheelchair, if you've ever seen somebody who has like spina bifida or has been in some kind of accident and they're in a wheelchair, what happens to their legs after a while? They begin to atrophy. So this man's legs would have been probably in an atrophied state. And if you've seen anybody who, who, who get around with their hands, who, who can't use their legs, their upper body is really strong, but their lower body is atrophied. Okay, so, and again, what's interesting is I was reading one of the commentators that said the average lifespan for somebody during that time period they believed was maybe 40, early 40s, mid 40s. So this guy could have been at what would be the end of his life, right? And one of the things I thought was interesting, it, the text doesn't tell us this, but how did he encounter him? How did Jesus encounter him? They're at the festival. Could he have encountered him the, the same way that, Jesus, that, that Peter and John would have encountered the, 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 you know, the man who couldn't walk in the, God, in the book of Acts, right? Was he begging for alms? We don't know. But he's there, and he's in this helpless, hopeless situation for 38 years. And I love verse 6. Jesus says, he sees him lying there. And he knew the condition that he was in. Now, this is interesting. This Greek word is really interesting. Normally, the word in Greek means to learn something and have a knowledge that you didn't have before. Well, this is clearly not the use of this Greek word here because Jesus knew all things. So it's not like he, he, he wasn't questioning somebody like one of the lame man's friends and says, by the way, tell me about this guy, tell me about this guy, tell me about this guy, Right? He knew because of his omniscience, he knew as God that this guy had been there for 38 years. Okay? I think what's really interesting is, is this a random man that he picks on? This is the question I was asking myself in the text. Is this random? I believe this is intentional. 
even though it seems random, right? Jesus picks out this man specifically because we see in the context of John 5 that no other mentions of healings in John 5. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is in this place where there's all kinds of people who need healing, and we only see one healing that's mentioned in the Gospel of John, and that's this particular man. I think he's going after this man. And here are some questions you need to ask yourself in this text. Why does he go after this one guy? Why? Here's some possible thoughts. Could it be because this healing would require work to be done on the Sabbath? Was Jesus picking on this guy on purpose so that work would have to be done on the Sabbath so he could have an encounter with the Jews? That's a real good possibility in light of what happens next. Could it be because of what he says to him later in the temple in verse 14? He rebukes him after he heals him later on. We don't know. Could it be because the guy really doesn't want to be healed and Jesus is going to do it anyway to show his purposes and his glory? Look at the guy. He asks him, do you wish to be healed? Hold on a minute. Why in the world would you ask somebody who's been in that state for 30? Of course the answer is yes. Of course. But notice how he responds. This is really interesting in the text. Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him. He doesn't say, hallelujah, yeah. Can you heal me? Absolutely, I'll take it. He says... Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Now, we, we don't know exactly his intention. But the question is, why doesn't he answer yes? Why does he answer the way he answers to Jesus? There's some possible thoughts. One is... If you ask people, do they want to get healed, they may say yes in their head, but they really don't want to. Why? Because healing brings attention. I know lots of people who, who need healing, not just physically, but in other ways, and they love wallowing in their dysfunction. Some people don't want to be healed. They just don't. Because they lose all the attention that they get from being sick, right? How many of us complain to other people when we're not feeling well? Oh, I'm so sick. Why do we do it? Because we love the attention, right? How many of us walk around quietly when we're sick and we don't say anything to anybody? We just, right? Sometimes people don't want to get sick. We don't know that that is his motivation, but it possibly. But more than likely, it could be this. He's given up. He's given up. Because look at what he says to Jesus. Sir, he doesn't know who this guy is at this point. This random guy comes to him. Now, you got to remember, they're at a feast. And if this is one of the major feasts of Israel, there are probably a couple million people in Jerusalem at that point. Massive crowds. Kind of like the EAA coming up. A couple million people, right? Massive crowds. And all of a sudden, this guy, this random guy comes up to him and asks him this question. You kind of wonder, maybe if he was asked this question previously. And he's never seen the healing, and he's, he's, he seems to have given up. Nobody can put me in. Now, is he making an excuse? I don't know. Is he telling the truth? Probably. Nobody's there to put me in the pool. Nobody's going to put me in. And even when the water's stirred up, I'm coming. I, I'm, I'm on my way. Somebody steps down in front of me. you got to think there's no selfishness going on around the pool among these lame people, right? I don't want you getting in before me. I'm going to get in before. Have you ever had anybody caught in front of you in line? Drives me nuts, right? It's just like... We, we live in a culture that's very selfish. Well, these people would have been selfish because they want the healing. They weren't thinking about anybody else, right? I love this. He seems to be hopeless. 
because of his response. But watch this. He's still wishful enough to be at the pool. If he had completely given up on the possibility of healing, he wouldn't have been at the pool. Have you ever been there, church? Have you ever been in a place where you just, you wanted something, you, you hoped something would happen, and you're, you're, you're like 99.9% in your brain said, it's not going to happen, but I'm going to keep trying because there just might be that chance. That's the state of this guy. That's the state of this guy. Really interesting. By the way, you know what the word Bethesda means? They believe in the Greek it could mean house of divine mercy. Would that not fit? Would that not fit well with what's about to happen? House of divine mercy. Think about that. Think about the condition we were in before we were saved. Bible says we were sick with a disease called sin. And there was nothing that we could do, no cure that we could buy, nothing that we could do to conjure up to make ourselves well spiritually. And it's only because of the divine mercy of God that we were healed. I love that in Isaiah 53 it says, by your stripes we are healed. By the way, it's not talking about a physical healing in Isaiah. It's talking about a spiritual healing, healing of the disease of sin. That's because of God's incredible mercy. What he's about to do here is absolutely an act of mercy because this man is beyond hope. This guy is going to spend the rest of his days in this condition unless Messiah steps in. No ordinary guy from the crowd, but Messiah steps in and does what he does. Y'all see that, church? That's why we sang the songs this morning. Oh, Lord God, nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is impossible with God. God can do anything. I don't know what situation you're in today, church, here, or anybody watching. I don't know what situation you're in, but the only hope you have is the great and incredible mercy of God to change your situation. And it doesn't have to be physical. It can be emotional. It can be spiritual. I don't know what situation you're in right now, but God can change your situations. So keep holding on for hope. He may not because he has a purpose and a plan, but keep holding on for hope because he may be the only hope that you have. Watch this in verse 8. Notice, he didn't, he, notice Jesus doesn't say to him, oh, by the way, you didn't answer yes, I'm going to move on to somebody else. This is why I think no matter what he says, Jesus is going to heal him no matter what. This guy's not going to have anything to say about it. Whether you want to get healed or not is not the issue. I am going to heal you. Look at verse 8. Jesus said to him, I love this, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Notice he doesn't say go to the waters. He's trying to show them that whatever they believed was in that water, Jesus is the ultimate source of his healing. Pick up your mat, your pallet, and walk. Now, this is interesting. A pallet, and this is what's going to be interesting. A pallet was what they called the poor man's bed. It was like made, it was like one you could roll out. It was made of like, like bamboo. You kind of rolled it out and you tucked it up and... You brought it with you, and you could lay on it, right? It's a lot better than laying on whatever they would be laying on. Just pick up your mallet, walk. Now, this is interesting. You don't see the man say, but, but hold on a minute, Jesus. Uh, don't you know from the text? No, I'm just kidding. Don't you know that I've been like this for 38 years? He just says, pick it up and go home. Get healed. Don't you think there's something interesting between this miracle and the last one? Remember what I talked about last week? A healing word from afar. Remember all Jesus had to do was to speak it. What does he do here? He heals people in different ways. Sometimes he puts mud in their eyes. Sometimes he kicks saliva and sticks it in their ear. Some, I mean, he heals in so many different ways. Here he's speaking a word. He doesn't, even, he doesn't touch the guy. All he says is, Pick up your mallet and go home. 
I love it. Verse 9 becomes the mistake for the man in light of the Jews. <laughs> Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. And, and I think John is very intentional in verse 9 to say, now it was the Sabbath on that day. He, that is not an accidental addition to this text because of what's coming. So immediately the man became well. Now, this is interesting. Here's what I love about the healings of Jesus. When Jesus heals you, whether it's physical, emotionally, spiritually, you don't need to go to rehab. You don't need to go to therapy. You're made well completely. Right? Anybody in here ever had surgery? I had surgery in 2010 playing softball during a church softball game. Tore my ACL completely. And I had surgery, and then I had a, a grueling eight to ten weeks of physical therapy. And to this day, I still know the effects of that. Even though I went through the physical therapy and did all I was supposed to do, right, I can still feel it. When Jesus heals you, there is no physical therapy needed. I, I want you to think about this. We look at this context and go, oh, the man became well. Isn't that wonderful? He picked up his pallet and began to walk. Hold on a minute. His legs were atrophied for 38 years. First of all, no physical therapy after 38 years would allow this man to walk. His atrophy would have been so bad, he never would have regained that on his own. He has no way of walking except Jesus says, get up, take your pallet, you, you, you're well, go home. No need to be here anymore. You didn't have to go through the water. I have healed you. Wow. But what I think is really interesting is the, the cure and the command are simultaneous in that word of healing. In the command, he says, take up your mat and go home, you're well. In that command becomes the healing. I think that's kind of cool. Here's a question for you in application. Do we understand that obedience can lead to healing? Now, I'm not implying that this man was there in this state because of his sin. Sometimes that's the case. We know later on in John chapter 9 that the man was born blind he was born blind. He, he, it wasn't his sin. It wasn't the sin of the parents. It was simply that the glory of God might be manifested. But sometimes there can be sickness because of sin. And lack of obedience can bring about some of those consequences. Okay? Now look at this in 5, 9b. The purposeful timing of the miracle again. The miracle was not accidentally done or done accidentally on the Sabbath. It wasn't. It was very purposeful. So if you go back to the questions that I asked earlier, why, why did Jesus pick on this one guy? Could it be a combination of all three of those possibilities? Could it be that he was going to heal this guy whether he wanted to be healed or not? Could it be that he did it on purpose on the Sabbath so that he could have an encounter with what was about to happen next? This guy, in a sense through the healing, becomes a pawn. I don't want to say pawn. That, so, that sounds negative. Becomes an instrument through which God can use for his purposes. Look at what happens next. Next we have, in verses 10 through uh, 14, we have the confrontation of the Jews and the questioning of the healing. Okay, let me read it. Five, five through, let's go five through sixteen or ten through sixteen. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, "It is the Sabbath, and it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet." But he answered them, "He who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk." They asked him, "Who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk?" But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. 
I don't think there's anything accidental about this healing. Did you catch the question? The question that Jesus asked was, do you wish to be healed? The question the Jews ask is, hey, didn't you know it's a Sabbath? Why are you carrying your mat? Why are you carrying your pallet? Do you see? Do you see the difference? Jesus does, he questions him out of love and compassion so that he can heal them. And remember, was it last week or the week before? I think it was the week before. When I, when I talked about Matthew 9, 35 through 38, said he was going through the villages healing all their diseases because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. He was having compassion on them. Why was Jesus healing this man? It was completely out of compassion for him. Why he picks this guy, I think, is because of what's coming. This is not a random eeny, meeny, miny, mo. okay, I'll get the guy who's blind. No, he's got the blind guy later in chapter 9. But for now, he's going after the guy who's lame because he has, he has a confrontation that he needs to have with the Jews. And God is using this man as an instrument for his purpose. Look at the question they ask. They ask the question, um, did you not know that it's permissible for you to carry your pallet on the Sabbath? See, they question the healing because of the law. It has nothing to do with love or compassion. It's everything about the law for them. And they ask him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? See, here's the controversy. The problem is not with the healing. The problem with the work as a result of the healing. Have you ever heard of a thing called the Mishnah? Okay, the Mishnah, it's a Jewish set of laws based on the original Ten Commandments. The rabbis had put this together. And they had, so they were taking the law, right, the law, which, which we see in um, Deuteronomy and other places, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, they're taking the law and they're adding to it. And what they came up with, and you can go Google this, just look under the Mishnah, the 39, the, the, the Mishnah divides work into different categories. Okay? And they had a category, 39 laws related to healing. It was not wrong to be healed on the Sabbath, per se. But you couldn't carry anything on the Sabbath. Now think about this. They give the guy a hard time about carrying his pallet. Did you know it's not permissible? What was I supposed to do, leave it there? Now think about this. If this guy is poor and he's begging for alms, is he going to leave his bed there? I mean, this is his place to sleep. Like homeless people carrying their, their, their mats around, rolled up mats. You're going to leave your, for somebody to steal? Seriously? But because he did that, that's why he called, was called out. Is the fact that he was not able to carry his mat. Okay, now, do you, do you sense any legalism here? Do you sense any, do they care about this guy? Do they care about the fact that this guy can walk after 38 years? They're more worried about, oh, you broke the law. And not only did you, you didn't break God's law, you broke our law. The religious leaders. This is a perfect setup for what's going to happen with Jesus. So what does do? What does Jesus, or what does the man do? He does what he's told to do. And look at what he answers them. He said, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. Why are you going after me? Why aren't you going after the guy who told me to do this? Which in a minute they will. This guy is, means nothing to them. This guy who's carrying his pallet is nothing but a mean to an ends for the religious leaders. They could care less about him. Right? And so he just does what he's told to do by Jesus. The man did as Jesus commanded, and it brings consequences for him and ultimately for Jesus. Think about this application for a minute. 
Obedience to Jesus and his word will bring consequences for us and others. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Have you experienced consequences from the outside world for obeying God? If you haven't, you need to obey God more. Because the moment you obey God and, and the world knows it, they will come against you. Again, this, the Jews had no concern for this man's well-being, only that he had violated the law. Are we more concerned for legalistic things than the well-being of others? Are we like the religious leaders? Are we so concerned about the law that we could care less about what else is happening in their life? Yes, we are to be standing on the word of God, but not to the point where we do damage to people, right? Right? I, I, I can't help but think about the, the, the Westboro Baptist Church. You all know about Westboro Baptist Church, right? They were the ones that were picketing and telling the gays that they were going to hell. You saw no compassion and love for them down in Texas. Now, are we to tell people who live a homosexual lifestyle that they need to repent? Absolutely. Because if they don't repent, they face the judgment of God. But how do we do it, church? What do we more care, to, what do we more care about? Do we care about them and their soul? Or we care that, you know, we're being legalistic about it. There's a real balance, a real tricky balance in all of this. So he... Puts it all back on Jesus. He didn't know who it was, verse 13. Jesus slipped away, right? It's a big crowd. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and says to him, what does he say to him? Behold, you become well. You're well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, what does, that, does it imply that he was done something sinful and this was a consequence of his sin? Possibly, but not necessarily. He's simply warning this guy. I've made you well. Don't go do something that is going to be disobedient. So nothing worse. I mean, he's cautious. He's warning him. And so what does he do in 15? He goes away and he tells the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Why this whole miracle? I believe verse 15. So that the guy could ultimately present Jesus as the one who had healed him. Right? And what's interesting, they broke the oral tradition. Jesus caused this man to break the oral tradition, brought consequences upon him before the leaders, is going to ultimately bring consequences on himself concerning work on the Sabbath. But nowhere in Scripture did he break Sabbath law. Nowhere. Man had come up with the regulations for it. Church, Jesus can heal. Jesus can heal anything. Do you believe that? Are you in needing of healing? Are you in need of a physical healing? Well, keep going to the pool. Keep going back. I've been asking for the Lord for probably the last 12 years to heal my eyesight. And he hasn't done it yet. Why am I so concerned about my eyesight? Well, first of all, because without my eyes, I lose my ability to do everything I do. I'm a visual guy, and you know, those who do the inductive Bible study know it's all visual, right? I need my eyes. But I also need my mind. And recently, I've, I've been struggling with remembering things and stuff like that. And there's no, there's no history of dementia in my family, but you know what? So I'm praying, Lord, heal my eyes. Heal my mind. Don't let my mind, please, don't let anything happen. You know what the good news is? He hasn't told me no yet. I'm still sitting at the pool. I'm still asking because I believe that God can. But the reason why he doesn't, we know, church, right? It's for his purpose and for his glory. I don't know what you need from the Lord today. But know this. He 
is Abel. Or as Cain puts it, you all familiar with the, the group Cain? Yes, he can. You know the song, Yes, He Can? Yes, he can if he chooses to. Is he able? I believe he is.